Listen only mode. Good afternoon. We would like to begin by welcoming you all to the Texas Veterans Initiative Information Webinar. My name is Kanani Quijano and I'm the Director of Communications for the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute. I'll provide a brief introduction before passing the presentation over to our panelists. We are very excited about the TVI program and the recently issued RFP that was created by the state of Texas, the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, and the Texas Health and Human Services Commission to address the mental health needs of Texas veterans and their families. Our goal today is to provide a brief overview of what the Texas Veterans Initiative is and why it is innovative and important. Before we begin the presentation, I'd like to go over a few technical items. There are a couple ways to join today's meeting. I believe most of you are online with the ability to see and hear the presentation. There may be some attendees that use the dial in only option. I want to reassure you that today's webinar is being recorded, is being recorded, excuse me, and will be posted to the Texas Veterans Initiative website. So if you cannot see the presentation today, you will have the opportunity to view it at a later date. We are fortunate to have over 100 participants on today's call. Because of the large volume, we will be keeping attendees in listen-only mode. If you do have questions during this, uh, during this presentation, we are encouraging you to submit those by utilizing your control panel, which is located on the right hand of your screen. If you have any questions during the presentation, we will attempt to answer them after each section. There will also be an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the presentation. All answers will be posted to the Texas Veterans Initiative website after this presentation. We will attempt to, we will try to omit duplicates and we encourage you to continue to check the website for updates. Please note that some of our answers that are posted onto the website may be different than the verbal answers you received today. All questions for the web, all questions for this Texas Veterans Initiative are due by December 18th. However, we would like to make sure that everyone knows we will be open to answering questions on the 19th as well if you do have them. Today's webinar is being hosted by the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that supports the implementation of policies and programs that help Texas, Texans obtain effective, efficient mental health care when and where they need it. Our vision is for Texas to be the national leader in treating people with mental health needs. Our team will be providing technical support and operational oversight to the TVI program, as well as evaluating outcomes of the projects that are funded by the initiative. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists today. Dr. Timothy Dittmer is our Chief Economist for the Institute and is cost-benefit lead on multiple projects throughout Texas, including the Texas Veterans Initiative. He has consulted as an economist regarding behavioral health and human services for nearly a decade and is an expert in applied economics Also joining us today is Dr. Andy Keller. He is the Executive Vice President of Policy and Programs, and he will be facilitating our questions for today. Our last presenter will be Robert Kincaid. He is providing legal counsel to the Texas Veterans Initiative. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Timothy Dimmer. Uh, thank you, Kanani. Um, so I'd like to uh, to start by providing an overview of the of the Texas Veterans Initiative and describe what we hope to accomplish. Uh, and then once I've done that, my colleague Robert Kincaid will walk us through some of the specific RFP requirements. And as Kanani mentioned, we'll field questions as we go, if you can type them in in time. Um, and also we'll have quite a bit of time at the end of the presentation to cover anything that, any questions that we weren't able to get to during the slides. 
Um, so I'd like to start off with um, what is the Texas Veterans Initiative? Um, and I, I want to talk about particularly who we're trying to benefit. So as Kanani, uh, I think she mentioned, I had the opportunity to serve um, twice in Iraq, both in 2004 and again in 2009. I lived and worked each time with platoons of infantry, infantry soldiers. Um, you know, these men went there as volunteers. By and large, they were not there for college money or to learn a trade or any of those other benefits that the Army cites in its advertising. They volunteered mostly because they thought they could make a difference to protect our country and bring some justice and peace to that chaotic place in the world. Uh, but since it was war, this service came at a price. Um, each time I went, we had soldiers experience traumatic and sometimes fatal brain injury injuries. Others lost limbs. For some of them, the stress of family separation and combat losses created psychological changes, anger, depression, sleeplessness. Um, our families experienced very similar mental challenges. Uh, for my wife, at least, the separation and worry, as well as the difficulty of raising two young children on her own, was really the greatest challenge of her life. Um, my home was not a very happy place when I told her I was going back the second time. Uh, when we did come back, most of us had the supports we needed to face these challenges from our friends and families and the, in some cases the VA and our local communities, but some did not. Uh, there are some things we can do that you all can do with your projects to help all service members and their families work through the mental health challenges they face. I know from personal experiences that, that people in Texas, more than anywhere else, want to welcome everyone who ser served home and to help them thrive. And the TVI is one way that we can make this happen. Could we move to the next slide, please? Um, so now I want to talk about a few details of the, of, the, of the TVI. First of all, it's a collaborative, and you'll hear that word frequently from us, between the state of Texas, private donors, and local communities all coming together to resolve gaps in care for the mental health needs of veterans and their families. The, the theory of change implicit within this RFP is that the most pressing mental health needs of veterans vary from local community to local community. Because communities have different resources, a one-size-all uh, approach or top-down approach probably won't work. The TVI approach is to promote local communities coming together identifying gaps in care for veterans, and coming up with local solutions. This is the process of creating local collaboratives. Um, collaboratives may decide to, for example, develop telemedicine capacity in West, West Texas communities, or maybe implement a housing first model for homeless veterans in Houston. The key is local collaboration to identify local gaps in care and the development of integrated solutions to these gaps. Um, I, I should mention there are other important Texas veterans initiatives. Uh, for example, I believe that the Texas Veterans Commission is also in the process of accepting requests for grants related to mental health, and I'd strongly encourage you to review their grant requirements and deadlines. Okay, are there any questions uh, that have been submitted up to this point on um, the public-private partnership? No, then let me uh, continue then. Um, a key feature is that this collaboration is to address the mental health needs of, of veterans. Uh, Robert will later talk about the details of this competitive, the formal competitive grant process, but I'd like to talk a bit about the one-to-one -one match, um, and I'll address questions on it after the next slide, after slide six. So the one-to-one -one match is, is critical, if you could put to slide seven, please. Um, a key feature of this initiative, which distinguishes it from many other important efforts, is that we're not focused on maximizing federal expenditures on veterans, on just pulling down the maximum amount of federal dollars. Instead, this is a commitment on the part of the state of Texas and many in the donor community, uh, as well as local governments, to use Texas resources to provide missing care to veterans. This is a joint collaborative effort, and we will require at least a 100% match from donor or other local funds uh, to the state grant. 
Each party is taking responsibility for providing missing services. So what will count as a local match? In the end, the project must have at least 100% matching funds for the state contribution. But we want to remain as flexible as possible. Uh, we recognize that given the short timelines of the RFP, many projects will not be able to raise 100% match. Many in the donor community have already made their grants for the year, and the January 15th application deadlines before new grants will be issued. So we'll handle this in, in two different ways. First, we'd like you to try to pull together as many local resources as possible before January 15th. And stronger proposals will demonstrate more local matching funds. Um, in the process of that, identify sources of funding that you're waiting on, that you've applied for and, and haven't heard yet. Um, next, our second way is we'll work with applicants and our own contacts in the donor community to find matching, to find funding for the local match as well. Okay, as you're as you're developing these local matches, be sure to identify the contributions made by all collaborative members, including in-kind contributions of time, office space, and similar resources. Okay, uh, have we had any questions submitted on the on the local match? Uh, yeah, Tim, we had one question come in, and the question was whether a public-private partnership could feature multiple entities such as veteran-owned businesses nonprofit organizations, academic and established healthcare entities? And the answer to that question is an enthusiastic yes. Um, and we should also note though, and we'll talk more about this later, that there needs to be one entity that is designated as the lead entity to sort of serve as fiscal agent and to be held accountable as a single point. But the whole point is to have uh, these sorts of partnerships. And I don't know, Tim did, or, or Robert, is there anything to add to that? Does that cover it in your mind? Um, I think that's great. That the more the better. We're trying to promote local collaboration. Yeah, collaboration though. You know, in the interest of the grant, don't feel like you've got to go get. You know, you know what I mean. Like it needs to be the right collaborators for what it is you're trying to do. I guess is what I would say. Um, we just got a second question too on this, and it's a current TBC Texas Veterans Commission Mental Health Grant recipient wondering if that grant could be used as match. And the answer to that is, is unfortunately no. Um, the grant funds cannot be state funds. Um, they need to come from local governmental sources, you know, county municipal funds. They need to come from private funds, uh, from a foundation, a private organization, um, or uh, those would be sort of the major source. The other thing is, and, and Tim you know, alluded to this, is you could use in-kind contributions. We recognize that not every part of the state has uh, access to the same resources locally. So if there are you know, folks employed, paid for by non-state funds that could be assigned to work on this or other types of in-kind community resources, uh, that would be uh, helpful as well. And I think those are the only two questions. Well, you know, there's one other question that, that we received that relates to partners. And the question on that one was uh, whether partners from outside the state of Texas could participate in the project. And uh, I think the uh, answer to that is that, you know, the intent of TBI is to serve Texas veterans. So that's would have to be central um, and their families. So, you know, it needs to be focused in terms of its results on Texas. To the extent a non-Texas uh, entity could help in that and has resources to bring to help Texans, that's great. But you may want to just be really clear about that if you are involving a non-Texas entity to make sure that we understand that none of the resources um, are going to be used to benefit uh, folks other than Texas veterans and their families, or if they are, that there's just a very clear way of having accountability for that so we can know that all of the funds through this project, both the matching funds and the allocated funds, um, go to serve Texas veterans and or their families. And I don't know, Robert, would you add anything to that or, or Tim? No, I think that's uh, very well stated, Andy. Great. And those are our only questions on that part, so you can continue, Tim. That's great. Thank you. Um, thank you all for submitting these questions as we go. Um, I know it's, it's probably a, a pretty fast job of coming up with a question and typing in and submitting it. Um, keep up as best you can, and then again, we can answer any questions that we end up skipping um, either later in the presentation or at the very end, we'll open it up to questions as well. 
Okay, the, um, while the focus of funds must be improvements in mental health for veterans, this can occur in a range of different types of projects. TBI intends to promote a holistic, self-directed approach to whole health and wellness. So mental ne health needs occur in the context of a person's overall health. Our focus is on improving, improving access to and effectiveness of mental health and other services to help Texas veterans return and thrive at home. Uh, mental health services can be a catalyzing factor in helping veterans to seek help for physical health problems, to get and keep jobs, to stay in homes, uh, in their homes, to function better with their families, help their children stay and do well in school. These should be outcomes by which we judge the effectiveness of mental health services. Similarly, initiatives focus on primary care, employment, housing, school functioning, justice system diversion, substance abuse and family functioning, all of those can be more effective if the subset of those participating with mental health needs are able to access effective mental health treatment. So the TVI welcomes proposals emphasizing any option that increases access to effective services, both direct mental health services with functional out outcomes, such as treatments for post-traumatic stress that we would measure with reduced CAP scores, or functionally focused services where mental health makes them more effective, such as employment-focused proposals measured with increases in employment. So do we have any questions yet on the types of projects that we hope to fund? We do, Tim. Um, one question is, uh, in some ways, a little bit goes back to the, the comments I was making before about uh, covering Texas veterans, but it also pertains to the types of services. The question was whether Texas veterans um, would, in, whether we would include exiting service members who are at Fort Bliss, Fort Hood, somewhere else in Texas that are active duty service members who have a home of record somewhere other than Texas, as they exit service, could they be served? Um, and I think that uh, we probably need to think more about that one, but I, I, let me just sort of tell you what our intent would be. Um, and we will get back with a, with a definitive answer on this. Um, but I think just so you know our intent, our intent is really to do two things. It's to help uh, veterans in Texas return home. And so if a veteran is serving in Texas, um, then they're living in Texas. And so we would want to be as inclusive as possible on that. Um, and I think the other thing is we don't want to be overly, uh, you know, bureaucratic about this. I mean, if if we're our intent is to help people coming out and some people, you know, end up living outside of Texas after they and they go back home, that's fine. I think we just need to have sort of a line that is reasonable and that we could that would be kind of make sense to both Texas taxpayers who are funding this as well as the private entities that are funding it. So I think if you can articulate what that line would be. Um, that's probably the most important thing there, and, and just try to you know make it reasonably focused on people in Texas, and that does include every uh, service member um, and their family who is currently based in Texas. So I don't know, Tim or Robert, would you add anything to that? I know we, we probably need to go back and talk to folks at HHSC and others to make sure we have the technical details on that accurate, but does that make sense in terms of a sort of a general intent? Yeah, this is Robert. I, I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, I'd like to just reiterate that we're not being very narrow in our definition of veterans. We're not interested in, in, in narrowing the scope of the people that we serve. If, if they're a service member um, or their family, then we're interested in helping. Which is a perfect segue, Tim, into our next question, which is would the TBI fund projects that emphasize families and children or is the priority mostly on adults? And the answer is yes, we would uh, emphasize families and children. Um, I think the thing you need to think about, though, is how that is how that impacts the veteran, uh, because um, you know that that's good for veterans and that helps a veteran return home. So I think in your your theory of change that you need to talk about, we we always need to bring this back to talk about the veteran. But in our mind, the veteran and their families' mental health is is important. Um, and, and does impact the veteran. So that's not a, it's not a big jump for us, but you do need to articulate that. Um, I think not so much to be eligible, but more to be competitive because we expect there to be lots of, um, lots of proposals. And I think you're gonna need to be compelling about the need. 
And I would think there would, you could you know, very well articulate a compelling need focusing just on the mental health needs of a family member or a child. And again, I invite Tim or Robert to add or clarify on that. Um, the, the one clarification that I'd like to make is we have this metaphor of returning and thriving at home. Um, I'm, um, I, I attend church with a, with a retired sergeant major who was a veteran of both Korea and Vietnam, and he shared with me recently that he had been experiencing post-traumatic stress and out of his pocket funded his own, his own treatment. Um, and boy, I, I certainly would like to be able to, to have this initiative help all veterans. Not just yeah. veterans of the, of the recent war. Yeah, I think within our paradigm, we're, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible on, on uh, who we can help. Oh, we're getting some background noise, and uh, we'll try to address that, but please just bear with us while we do. Okay, well, let's uh, go to our next question. Um, so there was a follow-up about supporting the entire family with their effort to stay intact. Uh, I guess the question is, is that a good rationale? And that, that seems like a good rationale. I think, you know, hope, I guess I don't want to say that's the only way, though. There's a broad ways in which mental health can help a veteran return home, and we really invite you to be creative and compelling around that. And I think those are our only, that's our last question. Okay, I think we're good on, oh, we did get a question about family members, secondary PTS, or those who have husbands, sons, daughters. I think that would be included in what we just said. I mean, I, we, we would be inclusive about family, and you know, I don't think we need to have, uh, I think however the veteran defines their family, we don't need to, we're not getting into strict legal definitions of all this. Um, so hopefully that answers that question, and I think is consistent with what we said before. And we just got another question about whether the initiative can serve veterans that are other than honorably discharged with these funds. That's a really important question because um, many uh, veterans' benefits are dependent on being honorably discharged, and this project is not dependent on that. That's a, an excellent example of a gap that could not be, that often is not filled, um, and that is by no means a requirement of this project. You could certainly serve anyone who's a veteran whether honorably or dishonorably discharged. Uh, Tim or Robert, anything more on that to add? No, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Andy. That's that's an important point. Yep, very good. Um, so uh, here's another question. In regards to the match, would clinical revenue count towards match? Um, and I think it depends on the source of the clinical revenue. If the source of the clinical revenue were um, uh, Third-party payments from insurance were uh, some non-state fund, so that would, you know, certainly Medicaid has a state portion to it. It has a federal portion, so I'm thinking right now Medicaid would not would not count towards match. State funds through DSHS would not count towards match. Um, but uh, the um, I, I think that. Uh, Basically, third-party revenue account. Now, one question is, what about revenue from veterans? I guess, technically, um, if a veteran paid out of pocket for something, that would be a local match. I think that that probably would be found to be less compelling in terms of a competitive, well, well perhaps technically um, qualifying. Um, we certainly haven't put a preclusion that you can't charge veterans for services because we're trying not to be micromanaging. But it, I would think that you might have a little bit of an uphill climb if you had to explain how that would be competitive, though you may be able to argue that it's more sustainable or something else. So we don't want to, again, limit your innovation. We do not think it's uh, you know, morally wrong for people to contribute towards their own care. That being said, we also begin, I think, with a pretty strong uh, belief that uh, we have a duty as Texans to respond to the needs of veterans and their families. And so I think you know, these folks have, have paid a lot already, and uh, you just need to keep that in mind. And I don't know, Tim or Robert, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I would just say that we're very open to how the, the local match is met. And if in doubt, I would say submit your ideas and, and let it be evaluated. 
You know, one thing to keep in mind on that is that, and we'll talk more about this later, but you know, there's, there's, we envision a couple phases to this project. And I do really do think, you know, taking your best shot for this phase is, is worthwhile in two ways. One is, and we'll talk about this, you may get chosen. Um, but the other is you may get chosen in a later round and, and may have an opportunity to kind of, you'll have an opportunity to see how you scored in this round and potentially augment things. So I think that, um, you know, we're really trying to be inclusive, like Robert said, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, another question came in about whether the veteran's character of separation matters in terms of receiving the service. Um, and I think this was sort of covered above when we talked about honorable or dishonorable discharge. Basically, there's no qualifiers that would disqualify any veteran. There's nothing a veteran can do that would disqualify them from eligibility for services paid for by this grant. Um, all right, we'll go to the next question. We've got a couple more. Um, let's, do we do the one thing? So this question is, are programs that also allow for family and civilians to participate as a value add for breaking down the civilian military divide and community reintegration eligible as well for this grant? Um, and the answer would be yes, uh, absolutely. In fact, that's really our theory of change is that this, these funds should be both filling gaps, but also bringing the community together holistically to welcome veterans back home. So anything that breaks down barriers, builds connections, um, is a value add and great. Um, whether or not it counts towards match, I mean, it would need to sort of fund whatever the service was or support the service that you are, uh, service gap that you're filling. So you just be, try to be thoughtful about that and, you know, crisp in terms of counting things for match. But please uh, maximize the other value adds, and that's a great example. Um, another question about the match. Does it have to be actual cash in hand, or can it be a commitment given the short time frame? It can certainly be a commitment. does not have to be cash in hand. Um, you know, the firmer the commitment, the, uh, the, uh, the better. Um, you know, I do think if it got to the day that the grant was implemented and the commitment was not honored, then that would be a could be a disqualifier at that point and we would go to uh, another applicant. Uh, but Robert, what do you think? Anything else to clarify on that part? No, I think, no, I think that's true. Just, uh, you know, we definitely want to see a commitment and, and you know, when the, the project actually starts, we want to see, you know, the, you know, firmer commitment and, and but just shoring all this up, uh, just get as much together as you can. Yeah. So here's a good question, another good clarifier. These all have been really good questions, by the way, not to single any out. But a question, what about a veteran who has a same-sex spouse since Texas does not currently recognize same-sex unions? Are they family members or not for the purposes of this initiative? So I do not believe the word marriage occurs in our, uh, in our uh, request for proposals. If it does, that was inadvertent. Um, and we're, don't wanna, we're, in, we're neutral on how to define that. Um, we are using the word family, and I think our definition of family is inclusive to whoever the person includes in their family, and that includes um, legally recognized as well as uh, a recognition that's not legally recognized. So if someone has um, a significant other in their life, if the person's in the veteran's life and it benefits the veteran, then um, they are included. And I don't know, Tim or, or uh, Robert, would you add anything to that? No, I, I think you have it. I think you have it ready. All right. So here's another question: Does a vet using federal funds for things such as education um, still access these funds as well for similarly targeted support, i.e., education supports? Um, yes, that's a great example of. Um, we want as many supports as possible to be leveraged. Now we've decided for now to not count federal funds as match, just because we don't want to get into that complexity. Um, we may evolve in our understanding of that, but right now we're really looking at local funds, private funds, as, and uh, in-kind supports as the type of match. But if you leverage additional things, that's a value add, and I think would add to the scoring and uh, recognition of your proposal. Robert or Tim, anything more on that? Nope, that sounds good. All right, the next question is about scientific standards. And I'm going to just uh, pull this up here. Um, so the question is, what scientific standards, if any, do the treatments or programs have to offer? 
We've defined this in the RFP on page nine, where we've talked about evidence-based and promising practices. And we have referenced there as an example, the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, which the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration maintains. That is an example. Again, we're trying to be inclusive on this. So um, if you can reference a source like that, if you can reference a source like you know the, the two evidence-based uh, PTS treatments that the Veterans Administration recognizes, um, though that's great, but don't be limited to that. If you have an evidence base, um, argue that. And, and it may, some evidence bases are more on the promising side. And uh, we're not using a single strict definition of promising that, you know, that there has to be quasi-experimental support or anything like that. We really mean, you know, data-driven. And then at the end of the day, you just have to, to be able to show us that there is a rationale and some level of evidence for the intervention. Now, if somebody has a high level of evidence and somebody has a lower level of evidence and they're making exactly the same impact, um, then, you know, a higher level of evidence is good. But sometimes you can have more impact potentially through something with a lower level of evidence because of the community support or other things that you have. So, um, again, it's, it's the overall compellingness of your proposal, uh, but we're trying to be inclusive and to support innovation. That being said, we're not really looking for novel experimentation here. This is not about you know, trying something that has a good theory beneath it or kind of a, an emotional or compelling thought behind it. It's got to be something that has, you know, some level of data. Uh, Tim or Robert, anything more on that? Uh, just to mention that, that part of what MMHPI will be doing will be an evaluation after the fact to find out, in fact, how much change did you bring about. Uh, and so you want to structure the interventions you're proposing in a way that that will be able to generate credible evidence about what change uh, you promoted. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and I, and I would just add, we, we want to see what works and what doesn't work and kind of get the word out to other folks who may be considering initiatives or projects for veterans. So, yeah. And you know, that really speaks to, too, your, I think, attitude towards data as a proposal, a project, a project that, you know, really was able to gather its own data and, and, and do quality improvement and, and, you know, ask veterans and their families uh, about satisfaction, to look at effectiveness, to monitor effectiveness. I mean, that's just as compelling as, uh, and to my mind, more compelling than having a bunch of randomized controlled trials. So, you know, I think what Robert said and to him that, that we got it, we want things that work. So that's the bottom line. Um, so next question, would grantees be required to verify veteran status? Um, no, uh, we don't have a specific way to verify that. That being said, we want to serve veterans. So, you know, it should be clear in your proposal that you are going to impact veterans or their families. So if you were, for example, had a general grant serving people who were homeless, um, and you said, you know, a high percentage of people in our community who are homeless are veterans, so we're going to do general homelessness services with sensitivity towards outreach towards veterans, but we can't guarantee that veterans would be the only ones served. Well, I think that I think you would need to give us some way to to be able to verify that the funds, all of our funds, were going to veterans. I mean, I think a lot of it is reasonableness and and uh, common sense. So again, we don't have like a strict mechanism where you've got to you know prove you know X number of days in a. a theater of war. You know, I mean, there's, there's no requirements that we're trying to put on there. I think we're really looking for people trying to fulfill the spirit of this. And if you're proposing something that clearly serves non-veterans, then you're going to have to give us some mechanism whereby we um, verify that the people impacted by these funds are veterans or their families. And, you know, like if somebody sneaks through, like, you know, pretends, I don't know, I mean, somebody gets through inadvertently, that's, you know, fine. I mean, we're not we're not looking to police this, but we are looking to have sort of a good faith effort to serve the veterans in your community. And I don't know, Robert, would you add anything to that? No, I would just say, and, and just uh, like you say, a lot of it's common sense. And we do want to serve Texas veterans and make sure they receive the, the mental health care they need and deserve. And, and uh, uh, we do want to measure it and we want to measure outcomes. We want to measure improvements. And that's all kind of fits into the process. And so, yeah, there may be these people that slip through, but we're not really looking at that. Yeah. Great. 
Um, next question, are you only looking for brand new programs or will you also consider expansion of existing programs? We will consider expansion of existing programs for sure. We're looking for unmet needs to be met. So I think the thing we would not want is just to be continuation funding for something super cool that needs to continue. Um, we're looking to expand impact and fill gaps. So you can certainly expand an existing program and that might be a really um, great way to, to fill a gap. Now keep in mind though, that our interest in here is not just filling the gap. We also want the gap to bring the community closer together. Now if you already live in a Texas community that has implemented a community blueprint approach and has people working together in an amazing and wonderful way, and you want to expand your amazing and wonderful collaboration to um, fill yet another important gap in need, that's great. I mean, we're really interested in seeing people be successful. So the fact that you have something really cool already going on strengthens your proposal in terms of the likeliness of, likelihood of success. Um, that being said, it does to some degree understate, or, you know, uh, make your need perhaps seem less than a community and we're going to have to, our, our, we'll talk later about our scoring approach. Our uh, review committee is going to have to balance all of the criteria. So, you know, there, there may be trade-offs, but you certainly would be eligible and I think could be a very competitive applicant um, if you were expanding an existing uh, program. Tim or, or uh, Robert, any more on that one? Not for me. No, I think you've, you've, you nailed it there. Um, okay, data sharing with the VA has been challenging in the past. Will these projects be committed to data sharing to demonstrate impact as well as for evaluative purposes? Um, you are committing to sharing data with us, um, the data that we require, um, and that can be in uh, aggregate form. I mean, we can we can certainly work out ways to do that that protect privacy, um, but uh, you know, so I, I don't think you have to overcome data sharing barriers with the VA in order to be eligible. Um, and if the VA is a partner, um, they would certainly have to uh, participate in our evaluation, but I'm pretty sure we could figure out a way to do that. Um, we're, we're, I mean, Tim, what do you think about that? Do you see any? You know? well, well, remember one of the criteria that we're going to use in selecting projects is our ability to demonstrate results. Um, and so if, you're simply unable to show results because of limitations with the VA, then, then you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. Yeah. Um, and there may be supplemental ways for you to collect that data. I mean, you may have to double collect it if the VA won't share it. But, you know, I, I'm pretty confident we can figure out a way to work with that. But you do have to be able to sign the statement and affirm the statement about participating in the evaluation. So you might want to look back at that requirement in the RFP. And if you still have concerns, uh, please ask us that question. Maybe a more refined question or a more specific question. Um, another question, is the type of demonstration project or collaborative, is this type of demonstration project or collaborative being done successfully anywhere else outside of Texas? I think that's, I think you're wondering about whether this approach we're doing um, has been done elsewhere. Uh, we think actually it's happening within and outside of Texas. I mean, I think one of the things we looked at to try to understand and build this project were uh, projects like those informed by the community blueprint model. Um, that's a model that's used in Texas, um, various Texas communities as well as outside of Texas. And um, there's a lot of other models as well where basically communities come together to help uh, veterans and their families navigate the supports they need, find the supports they need. And a lot of those are, are dependent on, on peers, on, on other veterans. Uh, and I think that those strategies have been proven, and uh, there's strategies inside and outside of Texas that, that, that fit within this. So um, I think uh, the answer is yes. But if you have more follow-up on question on that, let us know. Tim or Robert, any more on that one? Nope. Nope. So the next question, does the money have to be used for direct services to veterans, or can it be used to strengthen a backbone organization whose goal is to partner with local veteran service providers for a collective impact-driven community? Um, I think the answer to that is a, a very resolute, it depends. Um, you need to show impact for veterans. You need to show actual veterans or their families helped um, and their mental health helped 
um, in the service of, of helping them return home. You may be able to do that by strengthening a backbone organization that then leverages the help from a lot of other organizations. But you're going to need to quantify that and be specific about it. It can't just be sort of an, you know, we are confident that there will be more people helped if you strengthen this. The, uh, so that, that, I don't think that would be, certainly wouldn't be competitive, I don't think. Um, but it may also, I think, may even not be eligible with, in terms of some of the evaluation requirements. But uh, Tim or Robert, would you add anything to that or clarify anything? Uh, just the refinement that, that these are, are one-time funds and sustainability of a project is another criteria that we'll use in the evaluation. Um, and, and so really don't have this in mind as uh, ongoing uh, financial support for backbone organization. Yeah. Yeah, the sustainability is really important. Yeah, that's a great point. So another question, another really good question. A lot of the veterans that this person works with that have mental health needs or have problems with jobs um, or housing. So could this money be used to fill unmet needs such as rent or utility payments for veterans? Really good question. So here's our, uh, our theory on that. We want to impact mental health of veterans to help them return home. Um, so there needs to be some demonstrable impact from what it is that you spend on the mental health of veterans um, and functional impact in terms of helping them return home, which means helping them get a job, helping them get housing. So if all you did with these funds was to pay for housing or employment, um, and more veterans were housed and more veterans were employed, that would not be eligible. But if by paying for rent or paying for utility payments as part of a broader strategy, you were able to, for example, keep a veteran um, who was in a veteran court who had a mental illness or who had PTS, for example, um, keep them in care, help them successfully complete care and reintegrate into the community of where they live, that could be a really compelling use. So I think, um, so I think you could make an eligible, you could have those expenditures covered by grant funds within an eligible project, but you have to have a clear theory of change that impacts their mental health and their return home. And you also have to make sure that it's compelling because, you know, and I, and I think and it's also sustainable because a lot of those types of supports um, are hard to do. So I would not encourage you to sort of see this as, hey, for two years, we're going to be able to cover a need that no one else will cover. Um, I, I guess if you were to solve the entire need in your community in that time period, you could. But um, chances are you would have other folks returning later, and, and we need to see how this was sustained. So I think that answers the question. Please follow up with an additional question if it didn't. But uh, Tim or Robert, would you guys clarify or add anything I said on that one? No, I would just say that, that uh, if, that, if that's the proposal, there would have to be some clear way to measure that. So you'd have to put a lot of, of thinking into how that would be measured and, and be able to articulate it in your proposal. Yeah. Um, yeah, most of our examples at this point have been where providing mental health services facilitates some other outcome like employment. Um, but there, there certainly are examples out there in the literature, of, for example, of housing first models, where uh, providing some resource like housing facilitates uh, solving drug abuse problems or alcohol. So again, m make those arguments. Great. And follow up if we didn't answer your question. Everybody should do that. If we don't answer your question, please send a follow up. And, um, and, and, yeah, go and ahead. Andy, I think I think this is a good. Uh, point to say, you know, we want this to be a very bottom-up process, not us telling people how to do it, but them coming up with the proposal, saying what the needs are in the community, uh, and and just you know brainstorming and 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 working towards an innovative solution to to the priority mental health needs in the community. That's right. That's right. And that's the bottom line. The next question, I think this. Uh, this is another really important clarification. Will funds cover staff and or overhead administrative costs of standing up a gap filling initiative? Can it underwrite current staff if their role was directed at this initiative? Um, so those are good questions and it touches on several things. Um, so again, keep in mind what Robert just said about filling a community uh, prioritized gap. 
uh, that is the bottom line. So I would think you could do all of these things that you, you mentioned in your question in order to, to meet a community prioritized gap. I think, again, you just have to be clear about it. Now, specifically on overhead, um, startup costs are fine. Um, it's perfectly fine to get something going. Um, this is the, the, the good the, the, the option that a flexible project like this has is that you can uh, pay for things that uh, that other funding sources don't pay for. In terms of like indirect overhead, though, that doesn't go to like some particular direct operating piece. So like something that covers, you know, uh, uh, someone like me who's in a, a leadership role but isn't working day to day on the grant. We're our benchmark on that, and we we're, this is going to go out in a, quest, in a specific clarification is ten percent. If you're above 10%, you're not precluded from applying, but you should definitely be telling us why that's somehow worth it. And again, this gets back to the point we've made several times that where we really don't want to exclude any good ideas, but if you come in and you say, you know, half of this grant is going to go towards the CEO of our organization being more available to provide oversight to the project, then you just need to give us a really compelling argument as to why that will impact veterans, how you will measure that, and why your community believes that's the best thing to do. And I do think, you know, we've seen these collaborative projects, for example, hire a coordinator. Now, I would consider a coordinator to be a direct overhead cost. Um, that, you know, so that's, that's, that's not um, indirect admin. It's a direct cost. It's just not a direct clinical cost. And that's fine. So um, we want to be inclusive. But we want you to be mindful of the impact and being able to show us if you have a lot of startup, um, indirect admin, or, um, or direct admin costs, that those are essential and uh, necessary to the impact that your community has prioritized. Um, is there, would you add to that, uh, Robert or Tim? No. Sounds good. Now, we're getting into questions, by the way, because you all are so darn smart on the phone. That, or that means we've got a great group out there. Um, we're getting into questions that are kind of getting into some of the content that's later in our um, project. So what I'd like to do is to just pause for a bit and to let uh, Tim and Robert get a little bit further along in the presentation. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about um, some of these fun questions that you all have. And we will cover all of the questions that are remaining. But I want to go ahead and pause and, and uh, keep submitting your questions, and we'll come back here in a little bit. Um, but I want to let Tim kind of continue and get through his part and let Robert get through the funding part of his uh, presentation before we come back. So, Tim, you want to pick things back? Uh, thank you. If you could move on to slide nine, please. So these next two slides summarize what we're trying to achieve. Uh, as the slide says, the goal is to help Texas veterans and their families seek and receive mental health care they need to help them return and thrive at home. Um, and again, this doesn't preclude services aimed at veterans who have who returned home many years ago but are not thriving. Um, and could you move on to slide 10, please? And our method for achieving this is to bring together public and private resources and encourage community-wide veteran-driven collaborative responses to identify and support promising, sustainable programs that meet those needs. Um, a little later, Robert will talk about um, veteran participation in these programs, but that's going to be an important one. Okay, any, um, anything that directly applies to these um, summary slides on 9 and 10 before I move into a, a more uh, narrowly defined and technical point? No, actually, Tim, I think go ahead and just get through the next. Finish okay. off your section and let Robert get into his, and then we'll stop again for questions. Okay, so um, let's move on to slide 11. So at this point, I, I should say something about the two phases to the TBI implementation. So the first phase that we're in now is the pilot phase. Uh, TBI projects funded in the pilot phase will initially have state funds available up to a um, million dollars through the Texas Health and Human Service Commission. This is funding that was pulled out of current appropriations. Uh, local collaboratives will be tasked with primary responsibility for leveraging the private match for the project. So we anticipate there being up to $2 million available in public and private resources in this pilot phase. Um, in this phase, we also seek to generate a pipeline of potential projects 
showing the Texas legislature the need and ability for funding many more TVI projects in the upcoming biennium. Uh, could you move to slide 12, please? The, the goal in phase two... Uh, Tim, just to clarify yeah. one thing, when you, when you reference current appropriations, I just want to clarify, these were unspent dollars already appropriated that were allowed to be redirected. These didn't come from any existing project or anything. They had been appropriated, but were unspent, just to clarify. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so our goal in, um, if we can move to slide 12, please. Our goal in, in phase two is another 10 to $20 million in state funding matched by equivalent local funds. Uh, the legislature has not committed to this level of funding. That's important to note. Although Senator Nelson has filed Senate Bill 55 to continue the TBI. Um, but a key to convincing the legislature to, to fund at that level is our ability to show this pipeline of proposals that have already been evaluated and are simply waiting funding. So while we only have state funding for a few projects immediately, a major focus of the initiative is to move as quickly as possible into phase two. And in order for this to be successful, we need to select and fund very compelling proposals in phase one and have a list of equally good proposals for the legislature to fund next year. So just to jump in on that one, Tim, I would just clarify that while we don't know what the legislature might find convincing, we would think that it would inform the legislature to see what the level of interest is in here. So I think we, you know, we're neutral about this. We, we're, we think that the level of uh, interest that is generated will be informative, but it, I just want to reiterate that it will be entirely up to the legislature to draw conclusions from this. It's just that it will give them, I think, useful information on which to prioritize this against the numerous other things that they will also find. And that includes a lot of really important veterans projects going on through the Texas Veterans Commission, through DSHS. And our intent would be, our hope would be that, you know, all of those things would continue um, and that this would demonstrate a way to meet additional needs. Um, and I just want to be really clear about that. And I, and I think one of the exciting things is that there's so many people working towards helping Texas veterans. Yeah. So do we have any specific questions on the two phases of the initiative? I think just keep going for a while. We got lots of questions, but we got to get, I want to get through some of the stuff that you've presented and we'll come back and catch it. Cause I think there's a lot of what you and Robert have to get into. will answer some of these questions or inform them. And I think, let's okay. just. Go. Okay. Okay. So at this time I'd like Robert Kincaid to speak about some of the details of the RFP itself. Hey, thanks Tim. I, uh, almost jumped in earlier and, and uh, just wanted to say thanks for sharing a bit of your personal story. It's uh, very compelling and moving and also thank you and, and uh, other veterans who may be on the line here today for your outstanding service to our country and especially your commitment to this initiative. So I'm going to hit some of the, the key points of the RFP process. Uh, my part of the presentation isn't meant to be exhaustive of everything in the RFP. Uh, so as you're looking at the RFP and we're going through it, if you have any questions, please submit them. If you think of a question later, then you can submit them by email. And we're going to post everything on the website as, as we said earlier. Uh, Overall, I wanted to say that I think we've developed a, a really strong blueprint with this RFP. It's, it's fairly thorough and, and we think it's fair. And a goal really has been to build in local responsibility and accountability through a collaborative framework. So if you have your RFP in front of you and you want to track along with me, uh, on page 5, paragraph 1.04, this RFP is for one-time two-year grants to facilitate startup funding to help local communities implement demonstration projects that address gaps in mental health services. Funding will be awarded on a regional basis. And our goal is to cover multiple diverse regions of the state through this competitive process, which will be evaluated statewide. 
uh, for this first phase, we're not committing right now to the number of grants. And it really depends on a whole host of factors, part of which is the quality of proposals we receive. But we do anticipate awarding multiple grants for projects and meet the RFP requirements. The target size of these grants, as Tim mentioned, is 500000 a year per local project for state funds. Of course, smaller or larger requests would be considered. And we really just want to remain flexible at this point and see what comes in. Now, Andy, do you want to pause for questions or on each slide, or do you want me just to go on? You know, I think, why don't you get through the, um, the sort of uh, details until maybe pause just before we get to the evaluation section, then we'll kind of catch up with some questions. Because I think the details you're going to go through in the next couple slides are uh, are good and, and will be helpful to people and give good context to answering the, remain, the, the questions we've been receiving. Okay. Let's go to slide 14, the, the applicant eligibility criteria. And if you're tracking along in your RFP, that's on page 7, paragraph 2.01. Applicants do have to meet certain qualifications or characteristics. The first two we're going to look for is, is there a, a lead entity, a fiscal agent? And we want that to be either a nonprofit or a governmental entity. And then, as we keep saying, we want this to be a truly collaborative effort. So we want local contribution, community capacity, and collaboration among the, uh, the local people. And then if those two things are met, then we'll look at some other stuff. Uh, for example, applicant ability. Uh, can they maintain and operate and establish this project in Texas? Can, can the applicant provide the services proposed? What sort of demonstrated experience does it have? And we'll, we'll look at several things within this. For example, financial factors. What are the, the strengths of the financial plan? What are the resources looking like? And are they sufficient to, to meet the objectives of the project proposed? And also, are they sufficient to sustain it beyond the grant term? Another thing we'll look at is, is key personnel. Uh, we want to know who's going to run the project and mine the store. And uh, finally, uh, another thing we're going to look at is communication capabilities. Communication is really key here. And it really includes big picture stuff like public awareness and strategies. But it also includes details like the capacity to effectively design materials and, and get the word out. We want the communication plan to, to show sensitivity to, to all sorts of community cultures. And bottom line is we want to ensure that Texas veterans will become aware of the services being proposed and, and, uh, and they can uh, understand how to use these services fully. Let's go to slide 15. The project proposals show a strong combination of, of several things. First is the, uh, the focus of funding, as we've said, needs to be on priority mental health care needs of veterans as prioritized by the community. And again, it's a very bottom-up analysis. You tell us what community veteran needs are not being met. And then within that paradigm, what are your community's priorities? Second, services and supports. Uh, now, key here is, is finding ways to get veterans' mental health care needs treated timely. And so the services and supports uh, should, uh, should address that, and there should be certain emphasis involved, such as post-traumatic stress and or depression might also encompass co-occurring needs, for example, substance abuse, traumatic brain injury, anxiety, other physical health conditions, and consequences of unmet needs like homelessness or, or unemployment. And as we've said, expanded services should include best practices with opportunities for data-driven innovation. Another criteria will be, does the project show an ability to gather data and participate in the required evaluation Tim talked about. And we need assurances that the community will help uh, us gather that data. And 
think it's just important to keep in mind here that a long-term goal in, in, the, in acquiring and using this data is to, uh, to have data-driven innovation, see what works, see what doesn't work, and then disseminate that. And then uh, there's also just a whole host of community factors involved, which we discuss on slide 16. So generally, we want to see, is there a community that's defined? And is there a collaborative structure? And what is the composition of all that? Is there a specific target population? And are there measurable community and client family level goals involved? Then we'd also like to, to uh, see a community leadership spelled out. Is there a collaborative existing or forming that addresses veteran needs in whole or in parts? And is there a clear commitment to provide local leadership in that? Next, we would also need to be shown uh, community readiness. Is the community ready to implement a structured, systematic process? We'll look at things like, you know, is there a history of doing this? Or perhaps uh, there's a willingness to develop uh, that readiness. And I think implied in all this is some sort of resolve to to, uh, to be ready. Of course, uh, next one would be commitment. Uh, Tim talked about leveraging local funding resources as one way of showing that commitment and matching public state funds at least on a one-to-one -one basis with local funds. And related to that commitment is accountability. Will there be an efficient and effective use of those funds? And of course, a huge, huge part of this is veteran and family involvement. We truly want to see veterans, military members, and their families as partners in this process with you. Next, does the proposal show community cultural competence? Is there a responsiveness and sensitivity to cultural differences? We'd like to see a demonstrated commitment that cuts across all program aspects. And I'll just say that you know, we can't tell you what this means for your community. I think at some level you have to rely on intuition and, and realism, but also, you know, a desire to learn and grow because these are all things that that, uh, that uh, are somewhat organic and, and can be grown over time. Next is evidence-based and promising practices. Will the community commit to, to these as an integral part of restructuring the delivery of mental health? And finally, we keep saying it, but it's uh, it's uh, so uh, embedded into the concept of our, our process is sustainability. Will there be a capacity to to uh, sustain this beyond the grant period? So, are there any uh, questions, Andy, on on the uh, on the criteria? You know, Robert. Um Looking at the questions we have, I'm thinking go ahead and wrap through the last couple. And then when you get to the timeline, uh, go ahead and pause. Or go ahead and go through the timeline, then pause on that slide, and then we'll deal with the questions then. Okay. So go ahead and go all the way to the timeline? Yeah. Okay. Which is only just four more slides. So uh, next is the uh, proposal evaluation and if you're tracking in the RFP you can turn to page 9 paragraph 3.01 and just uh, briefly I would say there's a it's going to be a selection committee that's going to be very well qualified to evaluate the proposal the Institute Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute and Health and Human Services will be involved in that and they'll go uh, select the committee it hasn't been announced yet uh, and then uh, this committee will go through and, and look at proposals to, to make sure they meet the RFP requirements. And, and uh, just want to emphasize here that the requirements are real and, and need to be followed. But then we'll look at other factors too. You can turn to, to section 3.02 of the RFP. Again, look at demonstrated ability. One of the things we want to see here is can can the proposal meet the mission statement in section 103 of the RFP, which basically talks about serving Texas veterans, eliminating barriers to care, filling gaps, 
encouraging innovation, assisting local communities, facilitating local leadership, aligning policies, and being very performance driven. We'd like to see all of that. And then the eligibility requirements that we discovered that are part of Section 2 of the RFP. And next, we'd like to see clarity. Is the proposed demonstration project clearly explained? Has it been well thought out? Is the work plan reasonable and feasible? Is the mental health need for Texas veterans clearly defined? Is there a procedure for attaining project objectives that are clearly stated? And then is there a sound procedure for gathering relevant process and outcome data? And let's go to slide 18. Another thing we'll look at is organizational capacity and expertise, both with the subject matter and also the ability to establish, operate, and maintain the project and provide related services. And again, collaboration, the collaborative effort, efforts, including the ability to, to uh, participate in, in helping raise this local match and, and also just the, the excitement and the coming together of the community and working together. Now, it's probably been said, but I just want to say here again that consideration of community capacity will be an element, element of evaluating local match commitments. Uh, so again, we're we're not saying what this looks like looks like for each of you. Just you need to tell us what that looks like for you. And then finally, again, sustainability. Can the collaborative meet the goal of extending services beyond the grand term? Uh, one more thing I would mention is the proposed budget that you'll submit. This isn't going to be scored, but it will be reviewed and. And like any project like this, it's you know it's very important to have it well thought out and, and complete. So uh, slide 19. Just wanted to mention some final points before we get to the the plan schedule. We're really looking for some pretty important. Uh, objectives, we're aiming at some stuff through these grants, including measuring improvements and outcomes, and then getting the word out on what's working and, and frankly, what isn't working, what works and what doesn't work. And so through this process, the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute will work with programs to measure improvements in veterans' mental health care. Outcomes will include access to care, veteran satisfaction, and improvements in mental health. And then the Institute will disseminate these results to other communities considering their own veterans initiatives. So uh, we can either stop here, Andy, or I can go through the uh, key dates. Uh, go ahead, Robert. Just go ahead and go through the dates, and then we'll have all the facts out. But we'll pause on this slide when you're done, and then we'll start going through questions. Okay. And so the plan schedule is on page 5 of the RFP, paragraph 1.05. We've already hit two of the key dates, of course. In November, we published the RFP, and today we're having this webinar. And for the next two weeks, uh, we'd ask that if you have any questions that you didn't think of today, please submit them in writing uh, to the email address that's on page six in the RFP. Uh, one thing I would say is I would encourage people to keep checking the website and, and see what questions have been submitted. We'll answer those questions just as soon as we can when they're submitted, and we'll try not to duplicate questions and answers. Uh, as Kanani said at the very beginning, we're not going to have the 18th as a, a legalistic cutoff date, no more questions, we're not going to take anything else, but, but we would try to ask just for the benefit of everybody to have as many questions in by the 18th as possible. And then for about a month uh, after that, everybody can, can work on their proposals and, and they'll be due on January the 15th of the next year. And we're asking that they be in writing and emailed by midnight on January the 15th. Uh, for the next month after that, 
the selection committee and the institute will be evaluating all the proposals. And then the goal is to, to notify those who are selected uh, by March 1st. And then their grant contract process will begin. Now other applicants will be notified as soon after March 1st as, as we can. Uh, we just want to uh, be able to notify the, the ones that are selected first. But we're going to have another follow-up web webinar uh, mid to late March of next year where we discuss the selection results. And we really just want to be as transparent as possible in this process. Let everybody know what was selected and why. And we also want to be very encouraging because, as Tim discussed, the legislature will be considering additional funding. And we want applicants to stay tuned and to stay interested, uh, even if you're not selected in the first phase, because it may be a very desirable position to be in if the legislature decides to come through with additional funding. And at that follow-up webinar in March, we're going to hopefully get some pretty useful information on and how you can get in on, on uh, additional funding if, if it becomes available. So with that, I would say let's go uh, to the questions. Great. Thanks, Robert. You know, I just want to pick up before I jump into the questions on the last thing Robert was talking about, about the transparency of the process in March. You know, you know, I'm sure you all can do the math with a $500,000 target and up per year and up to $2 million. You know, maybe the you know two, three, maybe four projects will get funded, and we expect to have a lot more applicants than that. But I really think that that post March phase will be really positive for everybody because we're going to be sharing information. We do are very hopeful that there will be funds for additional grants. And that also people can sort of learn from each other. You may have noticed in the RFP that we are telling you we're going to, you need to let us publicly use your proposal. So don't put any of your super secrets in there because we're going to put it on our website and we're going to share everybody's proposals and show which ones were more successful and which ones were, you know, didn't meet uh, eligibility. We're not going to like, you know, be negative about your proposal, but we are going to, Put all of that out there. So um, just prepare yourself for that. And, and if you have questions about that, please ask us. But that is that's uh, noted. That sort of uh, plan to do that is noted in the RFP, and, and we certainly want you all to be aware of that. So let's. Uh, with that, we're going to jump back into the questions, and these really kind of cover quite a few of the things that were discussed. Um, the first one is whether the funds can be used towards awareness as opposed to direct client services, as well as could they be used for training, and. Again, and you may get tired of me saying this, the answer is yes, but you need to be able to show direct impact on individual veterans and individual families of veterans. So if you do awareness, uh, like a, a radio spot, well, you'd have to be able to have us see somehow how that resulted in more veterans getting something. So you'd have to have some baseline, you'd have to have clear tracking and evaluation to show that it worked. Um, and again, you got to be compelling. So, if, you know, you've got somebody who, you know, shows us they're meeting a very specific need and you can't be that specific, then you're probably not going to be as competitive. Tim or uh, Robert, anything you would add on that? The communication plan is an important element within these proposals. So getting the word out is, is something that we'll be uh, looking at. Um, yeah, that's communication is important for all of them. But I was, I guess, interpreting that question. I mean, could you only do that? And and uh, you know, could, and I think absolutely, we want everybody to do communication. But you've got to show impact. So uh, next question is: Is there a cost band? I think this is was answered by Robert uh, in the details that our target is five hundred thousand. But um, if you propose a one dollar proposal or a five million dollar proposal. We're not going to disqualify that. We're certainly not going to fund a $5 million proposal fully, so you should make sure that it's scalable. But um, there, there's, no there's no exclusion. It's just that we're hoping to fund you know, more than one project, two, three, four, hopefully. Um, so you know, if you put in a $3 million proposal, you know, you're not going to get $3 million. You're probably not going to get $2 million unless, you know, you're gonna, unless it's, it would have – no, we probably wouldn't do that. So even if you were going to have an amazing project that, that addressed every possible need, um, we still would probably not fund just one. Um, 
Robert, Tim, any more on the cost band you would say? Nope. Okay. Um, will there be an effort to lead veterans to the VA mental health care? How will we exchange information with them or improve their ability to request the proper resources? We will do nothing. We are not doing anything. We are just going to fund and evaluate and support the grantee. Hopefully the grantee will do this. Um, I think this is really important. I mean, we see this initiative as being launched in partnership with the VA, whether that's a formal partnership or just sort of in spirit alongside the VA. It's really looking to the grantee to talk about how in their community they will help veterans get access to the full range of services and support. So um, I don't know if the intent of the question was whether we were going to do anything, but if it was, we will not. But we would like you to, and we would like you, and that's certainly an important strategy. Now, it's not a requirement that you coordinate with your VA. We talked about that. I mean, the VA is a really important resource, and um, it certainly could be a very viable strategy to collaborate with the VA. But we didn't want to make that a requirement because not every community has a strong VA presence. Not every veteran wants to use the VA. Not every veteran probably should use the VA. And certainly not every veteran qualifies to use the VA. So... Um, it's really up to you to make those linkages to position the VA, and it's fine to not have the VA involved. Um, though, if you are doing things that are entirely redundant with the VA, then we, I, I don't think you're going to be as competitive. Um, but uh, th that's really the situation of the VA. Would you guys add anything to that, Tim or uh, Robert? Um, I'd like to mention that you know the the VA is um, is often aware of their own uh, bureaucratic limitations. On ability to provide services, so they really are an excellent partner at at uh, identifying gaps in care and filling them. Um, next question: There are many reservists or National Guard members who serve for more than five years without being activated. In many instances, they are not considered veterans. Question is: Will they be able to get assistance in regards to this grant? Well, so. This may be one we have to get back to you on, but Tim, let me kind of pose you a question. I mean, and Robert too. I mean, my sense is that the intent here is to uh, help returning veterans or their families, which does mean that there would need to be some level of deployment. I'm not sure there would need to be deployment to an active, you know, combat theater, but there would need to be deployment. So I would think someone who was in the guard for five years, you know, uh, or reserve and you know, participated in the train in their necessary training and, and all the things they would do, but wasn't actually deploy activated, um, would not be eligible. But do you do you want to? Um, what, one refinement I have on that, Andy, is that um, if you can identify a, a group of reservists or guardsmen that suffer um, or experience um, mental illness or trauma as the result of their guard service, even though they they didn't in fact deploy then I would think that would be a very legitimate um, target for your projects. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think and, that... You know, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking particularly of the, of the problem with uh, sexual abuse in the military. Um, that isn't, that's a real mental health problem, but isn't directly related to, to deployment to combat. Yeah. I think, what really think about, I think the thing we have to think about is that, you know, we're... Um, trying to impact the mental health needs of veterans. So it's not just mental health needs of serving individuals. So we'll, I think we'll just have to think about this one. And, um, you know, we're certainly interested if folks have questions or want to send more information about what you're thinking there, if we can maybe give a more specific answer. So if there's a specific subgroup of reservists or National Guard members that you're thinking about, we could maybe be more specific. So please send us follow-up questions on that one. But I think we we got to kind of it's not just mental health need. It's it's uh, it's there's the veteran aspect. But it's, it's a good point, Tim. And certainly, uh, I'm really glad you mentioned military sexual trauma because the the mental health need that's met does not have to be one that comes just from from being in combat. And and it could be, you know, depression. It could be. Uh, trauma of another sort, your military sexual trauma, you know, other things as well. So it's certainly those mental health needs are absolutely within the purview of this grant. It's just a question about uh, who is a veteran that I think we need to think about. But do you have more thoughts on that, Tim? 
Uh, no, the, other than, again, our previous comments, of we're going to try to be inclusive as possible, but the, the, the metaphor of, of um, helping veterans return home is, is important. Yep. Okay. Next question. Does the in-kind match have to be directly linked to veterans? For example, third-party payer source generated by the agency but not generated through serving veterans? Okay, so two-part answer. No, it does not have to be linked in terms of the generation of the funds, but it does have to be linked in terms of the expenditure of the funds. You can do anything that is legal to uh, generate the funds. You can run a lemonade stand. You can do anything you want to bring in the funds. Um, you just or, or the in-kind resources, um, but you just have to expend it on the gaps in service that you have targeted with your community. Does that seem fair enough, Tim and Robert? Yes. Yep. Um, next question. Can a TVI grant be a standalone award to fund a program that aligns with the goal of the initiative, or do all grants have to be matching grants up to a one-to-one -one ratio? So I think I understand this question. Basically, can, do you need to have a match? The answer is yes, you need to have a match. And the rationale for the match is to leverage the dollars. We want to have, I mean, just to be really explicit, we want to have twice the impact that we could have if we only used the state funds. So um, I do not think a grant that did not have any, that, that had a match below one-to-one -one ratio would be eligible. However, remember what we said earlier, about how you may not have time or ability in your community to find a grant. What we're gonna do is we're going to rate these proposals and rank them, and we're going, and we're not gonna rank them based on match. We're gonna rank them and rate them based on impact. Now, if you have a lot of match, you're probably, you may very well have more impact, but, but not necessarily. So if you can't find a match during the time period, then what you, we will do is we will, Put this out to the group of funders, uh, of foundations primarily, who have expressed interest to us and who will continue to express interest to us, and there's quite a few, and we'll put them out there regionally because a lot of foundations are restricted <coughs> to specific regions of the state. So we will put that out and we will see if we can find you a match. So if you've got something really cool to do and we can't, and you don't have a match, uh, put it in anyway, and let us try to find you a match. Now you won't, will be, you will be at somewhat of a disadvantage compared to other folks. But keep in mind that we're going to share this information with funders. And if you've got something really cool, there's nothing that prohibits a funder from saying, "Hey, you know, there weren't funds available through this initiative, but you know, in my town, uh, let's pick uh, Amarillo, um, we want to fund this." And they, the funder may decide to just go fund this themselves because we're going to share this and be somewhat of a clearinghouse to private funders. So do not. Uh, fail to uh, put a grant in just because you don't have a match source, but you need to contemplate what the impact would be for the grant source because um, because that's the whole point is to have twice as much impact or maybe more than twice as much impact by having uh, a match. So hopefully that answers the question. Tim or Robert, anything you would add? No, I, I think that's exactly right. Just uh, you have to think of the impact. So for example, if there's a proposal coming from Amarillo and one coming from Harlingen and the selection committee is pretty equal on, they think they're both neat projects and the one in, in Amarillo has the, uh, the one in one match already provided, they may be at a competitive advantage uh, in getting this uh, uh, first phase grant. Yeah. That's just, that's just reality. Yeah, I mean, there's just more likely. But I mean, if you had a super cool grant, I think we've got funders, if they fund it in your region, who would probably be interested in, I mean, I think you've got a good chance. It's just that, of course, it's always better to have, you know, these things already figured out if you can. Yeah, maybe the one, say, down in Harlingen, the selection committee thinks, wow, this is such a great idea. You know, we're going to do, you know, the look at the institute and say, let's do everything we can to go find the, you know, help them find this match. Yeah, that's right. We, we will go look. I mean, we, we want... Impact. Very cool. All right, next question. One of our programs involves training inmates in Texas prisons to train service dogs for post-traumatic stress. Would funding be allowed to be used within that capacity given that the person, folks are in prison? So there's kind of two questions there. One is, is being in prison an exclusion to receiving service? And two, 
uh, the specific use of the service dogs through PTS. So let me kind of take those in order. In terms of being excluded because someone's in prison, the answer is no. No veteran is excluded. Uh, veterans in prison need help too. Um, and I think, you know, just need to talk about what the impact of that help would be. I mean, uh, help, and I think the more you can help them return home, um, because we don't see prison as a home, uh, you just need to kind of think about how that's translatable and supports them returning home eventually. Um, second thing about training service dogs for PTS, you'd have to talk about what the evidence base was for that. Um, and I think this is really important. There's a lot of super cool things out there that can be used, um, but the evidence base isn't always clear. Now, I have no idea what the evidence base is for that, so I'm not commenting on that, but I, I would say this about any support that, was, that you mentioned. But just make sure that you tell us what that evidence base is. It doesn't have to be a formal EBP, but there has to be some data, and it has to be able to be competitive against the other things that people would show there being impact from. And that sounds like a great thing to do, but just keep in mind it'll be compared to other things. Um, Andy, if I could just make one other comment on that specific example. The community collaborative is, a, is an important element of this RFP. Um, and so if the, the training of these dogs is for distribution nationwide, um, it's not clear how that how that impacts a particular community. Um, and so that, that needs to be an important component of, of the proposal. Yes, very important. So those community linkages, and that's really critical for people you know, re-entering society, not just returning as a veteran, but re-entering from having served uh, time in an incarcerated setting. So the next question is, what is the timetable for announcing members of the review committee? The timetable is to have them announced in time to get the uh, proposals reviewed and decisions made, <laughs> which means we don't know, but it will be some time so that we have them in place by mid-January and we can get going. To be honest, we're not all that concerned about getting it announced. We're more concerned about getting them convened. And so once we get them convened, we'll let you know. But um, our main part is to find the best people we can, to have a representative group that represents a lot of different perspectives, that represents veterans. Um, and so that's the plan there. I don't know, Tim or, or uh, Robert, you want any specifics to that? No, that's good. OK. Will grant funds be distributed in a lump sum or incrementally over the lifetime of the grant? Um, I think that we intend to distribute in a lump sum up front, and then you'll have to, you know, account for those at the end. But is that your understanding, Robert? I think I think that's going to be part of the negotiations. We uh, we might do it that way, or we might have some some key dates where there's some that are uh, funded that way. Yeah. I, just, I think we really just want to leave it open and see what comes in. Yeah, I think right. TPI is going to sign a contract with the with the grantees who are awarded funds, and that that would be one of the items to negotiate in the contract. I just want to say though, our preference is to have it be low burden on both, on everybody. So I, you know, I don't think it's going to be a highly micromanaged thing. Now keep in mind, it does have to you do have to comply with HHSC funding requirements, and so um, that's something that, a, that like Tim and Robert said, HHSC. Um, TVI and the grantee will negotiate, but I, I think you can count on it not being that onerous. And if there's some reason why you need the funds earlier, then we're going to be responsive to that. Um, do matching funds need to be secured by January 15th? No. Matching funds need to be available by the implementation, which will happen in uh, late March, early April. So that, that's when you'd need to have the funds. Robert or Tim, any clarifications on that one? Nope, that's right. Okay, next question. Is there a target dollar amount per veteran served to determine how many veterans you would be served for the grand amount? No. We're not trying to micromanage you. We are trying to help you maximize impact. That being said, you should try to maximize impact. And keep in mind, you've got, well, there's 120 people on this call. So, you know, let's say that one in six puts in a proposal, you've got 20 proposals, so you've got to show impact that's competitive. I think that's, uh, anything more on that, Tim or Robert? No, since we're talking about meeting a diversity of veterans' needs, there may be some really high impact needs, that high impact in the sense of their intense needs on the part of a small number of veterans, and those will count. So someone referenced a question about uh, the VA's definitions of who's a veteran and who's not. Um, we are not referencing those. 
we are referencing your community's definition of who's a veteran and more importantly, the veterans in your community's definition of who's a veteran. Um, you know, I, I think I want to clarify too that we're also being um, inclusive of all veterans. So, you know, for example, let's say you've got someone in the Coast Guard. Well, the Coast Guard is active duty. And so someone returning to civilian life from the Coast Guard uh, would qualify in my mind. And another question is, would be you have, let's say, a member of the Reserve or National Guard who's activated in response to a natural disaster um, in the United States or to uh, go do service along the Texas border to supplement uh, border security or to go into a community that's having some sort of civil unrest. I think we would include all of that. I mean, to us, you know, service in the military, whatever branch and whatever type of service where you are actively deployed in a task would uh, would qualify. But, you know, Tim or Robert, would you guys add or clarify anything on that? Nope. That's right. All right. So we are, by the way, getting close to the end of the questions that have been submitted. And just so you know, we are not afraid to end this webinar early. So um, if you have questions or you, you went to get a, a soda or something and you're coming back, you know, uh, make sure you get back and ask your question because when we're out of questions, we'll stop. Um, we have another question that came in. Um, one of the last couple that we have is about whether rural proposals will be disadvantaged in this process because large metro areas have more veterans. And the answer is we will do everything we can so that they are not. We um, recognize it's not just sheer numbers of veterans, it's also the impact on your community. And um, you know the, the needs in rural areas are often greater because the services and supports are not present. Um, there's other uh, wonderful supports that rural communities have that make them uh, that, that are strengths and can be leveraged, but uh, we're not going to base this just simply on a raw numerical count of the number of veterans and or family members who are served. Um, so we will definitely, and we would hope to be inclusive of some rural projects. That being said, we're not putting in, we're not limiting ourselves to saying we're going to have to fund one rural or urban one. If the two coolest projects are all, or three coolest projects are all in rural areas, that's what we're going to fund. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's the plan there. But Robert or uh, Tim, would you add anything on that? I think that's exactly right. Yeah, I think some of the, the most obvious gaps in care occur in, in rural settings. Um, so I'd like to see some of those projects. All right, so let's go to the next question. Repeat. Someone asked to repeat the cost band question. So on the cost band, there is no cost band. Um, the target is $500,000, um, but you can propose more or less. $500,000 a year, so that's like a million. Um, but you can propose more or less. If you propose $1, that's probably not very going to be a very competitive project. Um, probably not worth our time to fund. If you propose $5 million, you will not get $5 million, but you may get a million of that um, if it's if it's the top-rated proposal. So hopefully that answers that question. If not, please let us know. So what is the exact website to find this webinar in total next week? Um, and Anna's questions. Excellent question. We should have gone to this slide sooner. And we'll leave this slide up uh, at least for the next 10 minutes. Um, but basically, if you have questions or if you want to get a copy of the proposal, if you don't have it yet, I mean the RFP rather, go to the website there, which is texasstateofmind.org slash Texas Veterans Initiative. Um, and you can type that in. I, it is a lot of letters. I apologize. But it's very memorable, and so hopefully that allows you to type it in enough to get there. And type in Texas State of Mind. You can see the veteran icon. You can get there. There's lots of ways to get there. If you have questions for us to submit, the email again is tbirfp at texasstateofmind.org. And we really need those questions by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time, and we will have a clock on December 18th. Now, if you send in a really important question at 12.01 a.m. on December 19th, we reserve the right to answer that, but we are not going to guarantee that we will answer that because we have to have some reasonable cutoff. We believe that's a reasonable cutoff. If on January 13th someone asks a really important question um, that we think we need to let people know about, we'll publish it. I mean, and we'll let you know. We're, we're not saying 
we will never answer a question after that, but we're saying we reserve the right not to, and we probably won't unless there's a really, really, really good reason. Um, okay, so a couple more questions. Um, Andy, what, one more comment on that point. Yeah. Um, this, uh, some of you with experience in writing proposals will just laugh at this, but it'll be important to go to that site and look at all the questions and our responses to it before you submit your, your proposals on, on January 15th. Yes. Absolutely. Very important. Another question. Good. We're getting a few more questions in. Can the source of the community funding that will be up for match um, come from race fundraisers or corporate community partner hosted fundraisers? I guess that would be like a, you know, like a 5K or something that would, you know, be, be absolutely. You can raise, you can do anything you want that's legal to raise money. Um, I think, you know, if you're going to plan to hold a race and you're projecting to get, you know, ten thousand dollars from that, then you should have some sort of historical uh, uh, evidence that makes you think that you're likely to get that. You should have done the race last year and have gotten the same amount, or had the race done in a similar community. And you know, and again, the the sure the match the better. I mean, if if somebody's got the money in hand and somebody else is going to have a race in six months and everything else is equal. Um, then they're probably going to have a higher sustainability rating, my guess would be, though not necessarily. And everything else won't be equal, so please do consider things like that. Tim or Robert, anything more on that? Oh, sounds good. Is the application available to be filled in electronically? Um, no. The, you have to, you're going to have to type up an application and type up the application that we have, and sorry about that. Uh, but you can file electronically. In fact, you can only file it electronically. We will not review hard copies. And if you are a person who doesn't have access to the internet, does not have access to sending us electronic copies, we will try to hook you up with people who can give you technical assistance to figure out how to do that. But we need to be able to communicate electronically. The level of coordination that's necessary for this requires this type of communication. So um, you do need to type it up and submit it yourself, uh, and uh, we're sorry. And then the last question I have, which I'm going to do one more call for questions before we stop, is uh, in designing the project, which is preferred, a focus on research to define an evidence-based practice or to maximize access to the program? So, you know, definitely the latter. We're about helping veterans. We're not about discovering new um, treatments or to extend the reach of existing treatments. Um, now, if you have additional funds that beyond the match, beyond the one-to-one -one match that are there to support research, or you're part of a research institution that will be able to learn from this using resources in addition, or perhaps even using the resources of the grant, but with tremendous impact that would be comparable or greater than the impact of another project that was not doing research, um, it was only doing the required evaluation, then that'd be great. That I mean, may be a great value add. But if you look at page eight of the RFP, paragraph 2.02, .02, where it says services and supports, it just talks about translational strategies to effectively adapt existing evidence-based and promising practices and communities so that they are accessible and available to veterans and their families. The bottom line is services, effective services that are accessible and available. So if you're only, you know, proven up a, a practice, that really, this probably isn't the best match for that. You probably want to go after some sort of, uh, you know, uh, federal funding for research, um, other university type funding for research, um, something like that. But Tim or Robert, would you guys clarify anything on that? I'm guessing that's a no. So the uh, another question, a question that was answered before was asked again, and was basically to clarify, can we match with TVC funds? So just to clarify, no. So I think hopefully that clarifies that. Um, next question, when we file electronically, I will want to send a lot of photos documenting what we have already done also. Is there a limit on the size of proposals submitted? That's a very good question. Um, I guess there's just practical limits. I mean, I don't think we have any restrictions on the size of email they can get through. That being said, you know, 
inboxes only hold so much. So, you know, if you're going to send something that's bigger than, I don't know, I mean, you, I, I'm sure people will send 10 megabyte proposals and that's, we're probably going to get a lot of 10 megabyte proposals. If you start getting up to like 15 or 20 megabytes in your proposal, um, then you're just going to have to be careful about that and, and, and see if it goes through and you'll get a bounce back message if it doesn't go through. Now, if you send us something by the deadline and it doesn't get through and you have evidence that you sent it, we're not going to be persnickety about this. We're going to work with you to, to get that through. So if it takes, you know, through the next week to get that to us, I mean, we need to be on it. Like you need to like get a hold of us immediately. Um, and we will watch for that, but we will uh, work with you to get that submitted. But, you know, try to be reasonable, I guess I would, I would say. The other thing I would say is that you will receive a confirmation that we received your proposal. So if you don't get that confirmation, you'll know that we didn't receive it. And then you can follow up and show us evidence that you submitted within the time frame. Um, and we'll figure out how to get things in. But I guess I would ask you to just, you know, be reasonable. And if you've got like, you know, 50 pictures you want to send us, Maybe send them in separate emails or, yeah, actually, you just said that. Send them in separate emails. Great idea. Um, so just try to be reasonable and monitor and just, you know, we have, we don't technically have limits, but everything has limits at some level. So um, just if you're sending something big, be reasonable about it. Um, and I would just add, Andy, I would just add that there are a few page limits in the actual application form. Yes, yes, please so talk about those. Just be mindful of those. Yes. Yeah. And we will quit reading <laughs> after we get to the page limit. I mean, we are going to, we're going to have to be respectful of that. Now, if you go, you know, if when we print it out, it actually goes to the next page. We're not going to be in there with rulers and exclude your words, but we just need to be fair to people. And we, if you uh, try to abide by the spirit of that, it'll work out. All right. I believe that we have no additional questions and it is 3:42. um so let's go through and do some wrap-up things if any questions come in while we're wrapping up we'll take them and we'll leave this uh this uh slide up until we can leave it up till four can't we? yeah we'll leave it up till four so if anybody you know, comes back from the bathroom or something and wonders how to get a hold of us this is how um but i just want to thank all of you i mean it's, it's uh gratifying to have so many folks uh, interested in this. Uh, it's a testament to the commitment across our state to uh, honor our returning veterans and to welcome them home and to uh, embrace them within our community. So thank you for the work you do. Thank you for your interest in this. And please uh, keep thinking, ask us questions. Uh, we want to help you be successful. So uh, take advantage of all the opportunities. There's no question that can't be asked. You can even ask again the question if you want about whether TBC funds would, would qualify. I mean, you can, you can ask anything you want, um, and we want to uh, to be helpful. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, Robert and Tim, thank you for your great work on this. Can I thank you for your work making all this happen? Tim or Robert, do you all want to say anything before we sign off? So I would just say, just reiterate, just uh, appreciate everybody's time and interest. And enthusiasm and and uh, uh, just uh, you know keep uh, checking the website for the questions and answers and, and stay in touch with us Tim um, and just to end we, we really do want you to submit your proposals to us we want to see a, a long list of them so uh, please work with us on on making that happen can I anything uh, just uh Reiterate, thank you for your time. All right. Well, we're going to be results-oriented, and we're going to end. So uh, you all take care, and uh, and do good luck, and please do stay in touch, and uh, please do submit a proposal. Take care. Bye-bye.